Hello, I, uh, my name is Tom Madry. I am ASMP's Chief Legal Officer and Head of National Content and Education. We are going to uh, wait a few seconds here as uh, people filter into this live stream from all our various platforms. Uh, very happy to have you here with us today. Um, we are streaming to YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, and I think it may even get over there to Instagram as well. Of course, uh, if you have uh, uh, missed the live version, we will have the recording of this video on our YouTube and over in the ASMP Academy after the fact. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, let me very quickly, uh, before I introduce our, our, uh, our special guest, um, let me kind of set the stage for what we're doing today. So, as everyone knows, generative AI has, has taken the photography world by storm here, especially in the last six months. Um, the first time this really started hitting the radar of professional photographers in a, in a, a significant way was, was last fall. And since then, every month, we've seen more and more advancements. And one of the questions that we always had was, what is the US Copyright Office going to do with AI works, both generative AI works and works that were created with AI tools? Um, back in March, and towards the end of March, the Copyright Office came out with some guidance on this uh, question. And since then, that guidance, while it gave us more information, it left some major questions unanswered. So today, the U.S. Copyright Office is going to be hosting a webinar in about an hour's time uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S. Um, and it is a free webinar and you can go and sign up and, and watch this webinar. And the topic of the webinar is um, AI and copyright registration. The uh, head of the registration department for the Copyright Office, uh, Rob Kasunik, is going to be the uh, speaker, um, uh, along with uh, another person from the Copyright Office. And I'm very curious as to uh, what they're going to be talking about and what kind of guidance they're going to give. So we decided to do this live stream where in the hour leading up to the U.S. Copyright Office webinar, uh, I am going to uh, uh, talk a little, bit, a little bit about AI. And then we're going to hit pause all go over and watch the, the webinar and then come back for 20 or 30 minutes and uh, see if they said anything uh, that uh, we need to dive into further. But before I go any further, I want to uh, introduce Matt Grokut, a journalist from Petapixel and um, one, of the, uh, one of the leading journalists in the photography space on AI and its implications. And uh, Matt is, uh, is joining us uh, from... from Overseas, and so uh, I appreciate you uh, staying up late, Matt, and uh, and and uh, joining us today. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, thank you, Tom. That is very kind of you. Um, yes, my name is Matt. Uh, I'm the news editor at Petapixel, and I joined Petapixel ooh, about this time last year, and that is basically when Dali was released, and so. In my time, I've been working at Petapixel, all of this generative AI carnage and pandemonium and just all sorts of chaos um, has, has, has come as I've been working there. And I've been writing uh, a lot about it and the implications and what photographers are doing with it and the photographers that are unhappy about it. Um, it's, it's been quite a roller coaster, uh, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah. so there are no rules at the moment and maybe today we're going to get some rules. That would be nice. Yeah. You know, it's when the copyright office puts out information, they call it guidance and, and, uh, that kind of guidance is something that everyone is craving right now. Um, it's, uh, we're in a, we're in a world where, 
um, where things are changing by the day, and especially something as uh, antiquated as the U.S. copyright system, um, you know, we're really interested in seeing what kind of rules they put in place. Um, if you aren't a uh, aficionado of, of U.S. copyright law, remember that we are working under the Copyright Act of 1976. That was the last time that the U.S. Uh, made a major revision to its copyright law. Now, there have been amendments since then, but I always want to point that out because one thing that is clear in copyright is that it moves significantly slower than the pace of technology. And even the fact that the Copyright Office has come out with guidance so quickly in response to the uh, uh, the the advent of generative AI um, uh, platforms that are accessible to everyone is a testament to just how impactful these platforms have been. It challenges the very notion of of U.S. copyright law in a way that um, that hasn't in the past. Y'all may remember the. Um, uh, the, the famous case from a few years back about the monkey who took a selfie, right? And that was one of the cases um, and one of the matters at the U.S. Copyright Office that really cemented this idea of human authorship, that even though it was the monkey who pressed the shutter and took the picture, the monkey could not own the copyright. And that's because the Copyright Office requires uh, human authorship to issue a copyright. We're going to look in a minute at some of the guidance um, that the Copyright Office has put out on this. Um, uh, and in some of the more concerning parts um, uh, that, that I think need to be remedied, because frankly, I don't think the Copyright Office is there yet. I don't think they've done the things that they need to do to make this a, um, a, a workable system for photographers uh, who want to register their work. Um, you know, Matt, uh, you've written a series of, of really great articles um, about AI here in the last number of, uh, number of months. And, and I have a few of them. And, and I was thinking maybe we could we could uh, look at one or two and, and, you know, you can tell me a little bit about um, about the genesis of these. And so uh, maybe this first one here and I'll see if I can share my screen here. So I, I read this the other day and I thought it was a really insightful take on the um, on kind of the whole situation of AI and what it means um, when we think of AI as a standalone product. But this article takes a different tack. Can you talk a little bit about what you, um, what you wrote? Yes, well, I was exploring the fact that AI machine learning programs, they have to be fed. I'm sure everyone is aware that they are trained on, well, Programs like Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion and DALI, they are trained on millions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of photos. And that's part of the reason why they do so well. But another part is the fact that they're using high quality photos. Um, because if anyone has ever had a go at training their own model. There are the programs out there where you can feed photos of yourself so that it can then spit out photos of you in all sorts of strange situations, you know, back in the 1800s or, or whatever. But those programs work better when they have quality source photos. Um, and I guess my point in that article was, is that there are going to be things in the future that the AI doesn't have any source material for. And they will need high quality photographs of an object or a person or, or whatever it is that they want to synthesize um, for it to work well. And right. yeah, that, 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 was my, that was my point because there's, <laughs> there's been a lot of doom and gloom as we all know. And yeah. it was just, it was, I was just pointing out that 
AI is rely on, reliant on high quality photographs taken by photographers. Right. And, you know, it, when I read these articles, I, I look at them obviously through, through a legal lens and it, it, your article made me think of, of kind of how I'm describing the legal landscape in relation to AI at the moment. You know, we're really fighting a couple different battles. There's the, everything that happens during the training and ingestion phase of AI and the legal questions that are associated with that, which I think are, uh, that was one of the first things I thought about when I was reading your article. You know, photographers are very concerned and groups like ASMP are, are uh, uh, very aware of the need of, of AI platforms to properly license work that they're going to be using in their training sets. You know, that's something that by and large, uh, has not been done. Um, and there are lawsuits about that, you know, right now, um, both, uh, both in both our countries, actually, um, there are lawsuits about that, including big, big groups like Getty. Um, and, you know, it is both concerning and, and, um, uh, alarming, uh, you might say that if your work, was online in the last few years, it's likely part of a training set for some of these AI platforms. It's almost impossible that it's not um, at this moment. So what are we doing to try to, to think about that side of the equation? You know, there are a number of groups out there um, uh, like uh, Adobe uh, with their uh, content authenticity <laughs> initiative. Um, with, uh, uh, with the plus group, um, uh, and working with IPTC and metadata where you can have a metadata flag, um, that says that your work is not eligible, uh, for use in training sets. And one thing that we're, we've been recommending to, to photographers as we've been having these, uh, conversations is to offer a license. If you are a professional photographer you can offer a license for your work to be used as part of a training set. Now, you might think, well, is anyone going to use that? Is anyone going to actually pay me for that license? This does two things. One, it allows you the option to have platforms that do want to have licensed work as, as the base of, of their, their training to, to work with you. But two, it fulfills a really important piece of the puzzle. And that is that what we've been hearing from AI companies, some, some AI companies and some scholars, is that using images that are available on the web for training purposes is a fair use. Now, we would vehemently disagree with that. And I think that the recent court case of uh, the Warhol Foundation versus Lynn Goldsmith uh, is, is, uh, is even more evidence of this because one of the four factors in a fair use analysis is the uh, impact on the market for the work that was used. By offering a license on your website, what you're saying is this is a viable part of my work as a photographer. And then if someone takes it and they claim fair use, you can actually say, hey, I have that license out there. And it's a real license because yeah. there are many photographers who have had their work licensed for this purpose. And so that's one of the biggest battles that we're fighting. Yes, absolutely. And I think if any photographers out there are concerned and they really don't want their images being used by an AI image generator, you should absolutely go and put that license on your website right now. Do not delay because then you at least have something that you can say, oh, well, I, you know, <laughs> this license was there and you didn't use it. Um, also as well, you know, AI companies claiming fair use, that is such a stretch. I mean, really, there is <laughs> zero grounding for that uh, at the moment. And, you know, that is, in my mind, that, that is wishful thinking, um, the fair use argument. It, it, it really is. Nothing has been settled at all. Right. And, and, you know, I think it's really important to note when we look at, at the fair use argument that, you know, um, 
there are and have been a number of people who are interested primarily in uh, in having images um, uh, not be subject to any kind of, of copyright um, uh, copyright, which you know certainly in our view would de incentivize creators in every creative industry from being able to create works and create new works and um, and and capitalize on their works, and that's a major concern. But this is a wonderful example again of how slowly the judicial process process works in relation to uh, the pace of technology, because right now it, there is a bit of a free for all mentality and the court cases that are going to help decide this are in their infancy. They're still just beginning. Right. Yes. Um, do you want to talk about what Adobe are doing? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to um, do you want to introduce that or, or? Yeah. Well, yes, because Obviously, with Midjourney and Dali and Stable Diffusion, they have just gone and taken pictures publicly available on the internet wholesale, stuffed them all into the algorithm, and they have used it to build their product on. Adobe, which have which has released uh, Firefly and it's released the new generative fill tool, um, they have gone a different avenue and they are using. Um, photos already available to them in their Adobe stock library. And they basically have the license to do that because in the contracts that these contributing photographers sign, it basically vaguely says, we can do whatever we like with these photos. Um, now, I wrote an article this week, and it was actually um, an article off the back of VentureBeat, and they interviewed photographers who were just not happy about this because they feel that they are, Adobe are, are building these uh, generative AI programs that are actually competing against them. Um, so, <laughs> so even though Adobe, and, and I've seen that Adobe Firefly described as, as being ethical, Photographers are still unhappy about it. And, and, and Adobe have also said that they will compensate photographers, but we are yet to see anything. Well, and, and I, I pulled up the article. Of course, remember, you can go and find all of Matt's articles as well as uh, many others on AI over at uh, petapixel.com. And, and we, definitely, um, we definitely encourage you to do that. You know, this is a really interesting question, right? Adobe is in a unique position uh, here. First, um, Photoshop and, and Lightroom and the Adobe uh, Creative Cloud suite of products are used by so many photographers, both professionals and enthusiasts alike. And uh, Adobe stock uh, was and is one of the uh, major stock agencies that are out there that photographers often would submit their work to. And, and Matt, what you're, what you're talking about is the idea that photographers may have submitted their work um, to Adobe in the past with under a, a, a license and an idea um, that allows Adobe to do what you're saying now, but couldn't necessarily have been envisioned previously, right? It's hard to... It's hard to argue, right? Yes, actually, um, th there's, there's, yeah. Here we go. Um, there, w there was a specific uh, line in the contract uh, that 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 basically basically um, is the one that legal experts are pointing to that says you know they can do whatever they they, they want. Um, the other aspect of this as well is that Adobe stock is the only. Uh, major stock uh, photo website that is accepting AI images. Now, there are early tentative reports that AI images are currently outperforming everything else on Adobe stock, including photos. It, it, it's, it's not super confirmed, but uh, early signs are that these AI images are are they are selling and I guess there is so much excitement about AI at the moment and lots of people want to use them because it guess it has a certain look and it's new and it's fresh. And yeah, right now 
uh, they seem to be doing well. And Adobe are just so well positioned in this market because, as I said, they are the only stock photo website accepting AI image submissions. And they have access to data which they are allowed to use, unlike the other AI image generators. You know, in it's so it, I, I'm going to. I'm going to take the other side on on some things Adobe is doing as well, and and because really when Adobe released Firefly, but more specifically when Adobe released the generative fill tool in the Photoshop beta, I think that was another kind of one of those watershed moment game changers with AI and and photography and what and what generative fill could do, even for non-professionals um, uh, who, who might just be playing around with it. Yeah. But Adobe is also focused on ensuring that AI images are labeled appropriately. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they have um, their, their content authenticity initiative platform, the CAI platform, which is a, a different wing of Adobe that's working in, in ways that that are, are you know, um, possibly with different aims than, than what we're talking about here. You know, when we yeah. look at the content authenti authenticity initiative, we're talking about things like ensuring that the images we see are not disinformation, assuring that we have a way to understand what images were created with what tools, whether those are AI created images or human created images. And, you know, that's a phrase that I think is going to come more and more to the forefront, and it has been in the many different groups that, that I'm involved in, um, uh, which uh, include, um, uh, which include, you know, human created images. That's a, that's a phrase we haven't been dealing with. I, I uh, uh, as, as we were, as we were sitting here, I uh, have had the pleasure, if you were on one of our last live streams, when we um, spent a long time talking about um, uh, Adobe, uh, when we spent a long time talking about the Andy Warhol Foundation versus Lynn Goldsmith, uh, my, uh, my partner in crime there was Jeff Sedlick. Jeff Sedlick, with the Plus Coalition, among others, um, is, uh, is an expert in this field, and, and uh, he actually uh, uh, sent me a note, and I think it's a note that is uh, particularly relevant, that less than 10% of Adobe's customers are photographers, but 90% of their customers are corporate licensees and, quote, creative pros who are not photographers. That makes even more of a difference when, when we talk about what Matt is talking about, um, where uh, Adobe is leveraging all these different tools that they've been building for these many years, and they're all converging right now with AI. I think that's a really important piece. Thanks for that insight, Jeff. Mm. Um, what I want to do, um, what I want to do now is, is switch over to, uh, uh, one kind of thought question before we look at what the copyright office has put out via guidance. And the, the thought question I have has to do with a company that, that, um, I was made aware of just the other day, um, uh, which, uh, makes some interesting arguments and I want to uh, I'm not I'm going to tell you right now that I don't have an answer necessarily for what I'm about to show you but I want to show it to you anyway as a, a use um, uh, of AI that uh, we may not uh, be thinking about or you may not have thought about previously so this company um, picked ID uh, talks about how you can keep people but remove identities. And I'm going to go to their use cases and, uh, and go to uh, photographers because a photographer sent this to me the other day and had a simple question. And the, and the, the, uh, the simple question was, hey, is this legal? Right? What, is the, what are the legalities related to this? And so what this company does is it offers AI-generated high-definition face replacements where you can anonymize models. But I want to point out one thing here. They have this big graphic, and it says, anonymize your models, commercial use of photos without model releases, de-identify your models and protect their privacy, and expand your portfolio. So they're saying, well, maybe th this is the original, but using their software, you can create this. And you'll notice, and one of the first things that I thought 
was, boy, if I were a model and I was hired for a shoot and the shoot was uh, maybe a non-commercial shoot or an editorial shoot or, or even some kind of portfolio building shoot, which uh, models and photographers uh, have entered into for many years. And then the photographer uh, utilized a, a platform like this, which kept my body and my hand and, and my, my actual modeling output, but removed my face and, in their words, anonymized the model. And then the photographer was able to, as they put it, you make a commercial use of the photo without a model release. What would I be thinking? Is that okay? And I think that's a really interesting question. And I don't uh, want to give an answer to that because I don't think I have an answer to that um, uh, at the moment. But I want to put a couple of things in your mind. One, when we're dealing with talent and models um, and model releases and talent releases, what we're really dealing with are, are people's name, image, and likeness and their right of publicity. And it would be hard to argue that if someone's face is entirely different and non-recognizable um, and is AI generated such that it's really not the face of anyone in particular, that that might be a, an infringement on someone's right of publicity or their name, image, or likeness. But then I thought a little bit further and I started thinking about, could that be the basis for contractual um, uh, not having a meeting of the minds or something maybe even fraudulent, right? You know, I think it's going to be important that uh, photographers who might be thinking about using these tools in the future think about how they describe what they're going to be doing with the images as they move forward. Uh, because, you know, if I were um, uh, uh, modeling agencies or, or talent agencies, and I was looking at the advent of programs like this, um, I'd be taking a much closer look at the contracts. And I think that's going to be something that's going to be more and more impactful as we move forward. Something certainly, uh, if you are an ASMP member, we're going to be updating many of our documents to address situations related to AI and address situations like this. And so I just want to put that out there because I found it incredibly interesting. And since courts haven't really dealt with, with this issue in the context of, of AI, it's going to be um, interesting to see where the first court cases are and what the results are going to be. Yeah. So. And al but also, may I just add that given how notoriously bad AI image generators are with hands, and in that picture, there's, there's still the model's hands, maybe models might want to get a contract on their hands as well as their faces. Uh that's right. <laughs> No, no, that's that's true. And, you know, that's the thing is that uh, I've heard from from uh, photographers and they say, well, I, I saw a set of AI images, you know, a couple of weeks ago and, and this looked terrible and that looked bad. I'm not I'm not overly concerned about this. Well, you know, uh, Matt, as 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 you well know, and as we've seen even since uh, the beginning of this year, I mean, the growth is truly not not in a. <laughs> not in a hyperbolic way, it is exponential growth, right? And so the quality is changing uh, so regularly that I think that next year this time, um, you know, we, we might not have a hands uh, issue, but we certainly do now. I agree with that. So, no, no. Um, so I want to switch over. We have uh, now, as a reminder, uh, if you are just joining us at the uh, top of the hour, the U.S. Copyright Office is having a webinar on uh, copyright registration and AI, which is uh, going to go into more detail based on the guidance that the Copyright Office put out uh, back in March. Um, we are going to hit pause on this live stream. It's going to we're going to leave it active and put up a graphic or two. Um, but we're going to go over and listen to the um, uh, webinar. We encourage you to do the same. And then right after that webinar ends, whether it's an hour later, an hour and a half, I'm not sure exactly how long they have it scheduled for. Uh, I'll be back here uh, talking for about uh, 15, 20, 30 minutes on what we heard uh, to see if we heard anything new um, or if it was just a recitation of the guidance. So I thought, Matt, maybe this is a good time for us to look at that guidance and see um, what, the, um, uh, what the Copyright Office said in their recent guidance about AI, um, AI works. Does that sound good? That sounds great. All right, let's see here.
Let me pull this up. Okay, so as we mentioned, um, the Copyright Office was getting a number of questions about AI-related works at the beginning of this year, including some, and the end of last year, including some very big um, uh, cases of artists who were uh, either seeking to have the AI platforms be considered the author uh, in one case, or uh, works that were in a, a graphic novel, for instance, that were AI generated, uh, seeking to get copyright protection on them. And as a result, um, in March, uh, mid-March of this year, the Copyright Office came out with some guidance, the Copyright Registration Guidance for Works Containing Material Generated by Artificial Intelligence. Um, it's nine pages long. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I highlighted some areas that I wanted to point out. One, if you haven't seen this guidance, I think it's important to note. Two, this is a good roadmap for what we might hear about today uh, and uh, and some of the questions that, that I still have about this. Um, and I'm looking forward to, um, uh, to, to seeing what the office says. So... Um, and I'll put this up uh, over at the ASMP site with uh, my highlighted annotations. If you um, if you want to go and, and download that, we'll make sure that um, that you're able to do that over in the document library over at the ASMP Academy. Um, and again, we're not going to read uh, all the background and everything, but this is part of the genesis of what um, of why the Copyright Office came out with this guidance. And so they say. For example, in 2018, the office received an application for a visual work that the applicant described as, quote, autonomously created by a computer algorithm running on a machine. That application was denied because, based on the applicant's representations in the application, the examiner found that the work contained no human authorship. There's that phrase again, and probably a phrase we're going to hear a lot of today. After a series of administrative appeals, the office's review board issued a final determination affirming that the work could not be registered because it was made, quote, without any creative contribution from a human actor. Now, they go on to talk about this case that happened in February of 2023, again, a month before this guidance was put out. And probably one of the, the main things that encouraged this guidance to be put out. So in February of 2023, the office concluded that a graphic novel comprised of human authored text combined with the images generated by the AI service Midjourney constituted a copyrightable work, but that the individual images themselves could not be protected by copyright. It's important to understand the distinction there. The work as a whole was copy, it, it couldn't be it was eligible to be copyrighted. It was a copyrightable work because it was human created text and the arrangement and the layout of the images were such that overall there was significant human authorship in the work as a whole. But the images themselves, which were created using the generative AI platform Midjourney, were deemed not to be protected by copyright. That started a whole set of questions that, um, that, all types of creatives had. And, you know, we, it, it, Matt being from Petapixel and me being from ASMP, you know, we talk a lot about photography, but every time you hear us talk about AI, I want you to think about all the other creators who are similarly situated. And that includes authors and graphic artists, right? And musicians. You know, there's been a lot going on in the music world related to AI at the moment as well. And, and it will come for video soon. And yes, and some of the generative AI video platforms, uh, again, are in that stage that the, the, uh, the image-based platforms were a year ago or so, and, and uh, they are rapidly increasing in quality. Um, so in this guidance, the Copyright Office next goes into detail on what that human authorship requirement is all about, right? They talk about how in the very famous case of Burrow Giles versus Cerrone, which is the case that 
um, that uh, this U.S. Supreme Court case had established that photographs were entitled to copyright protection. Um, they said that the court held there was no doubt that the Constitution's copyright clause permitted photographs to be subject to copyright, quote, so far as they are representatives of the original intellectual conceptions of the author. And this is what the Copyright Office has hung their hat on in this whole AI discussion is they've pushed back repeatedly to uh, to the idea of uh, of human authorship. Um, the and so here's what the office says in the case of works containing AI generated material, the office will consider whether the AI contributions are the result of mechanical reproduction or instead of an author's quote own original mental conception to which the author gave visible form. So this is a, a different kind of situation than, than we run into now where this level of analysis done by the Copyright Office is not particularly common. I wanted to point out this next little set and Later on, I have some highlights in red that we're about to get to, and those are the ones I really want to uh, I really want to dig in on. But the Copyright Office in this guidance says, if a work's traditional elements of authorship were produced by a machine, the work lacks human authorship, and the office will not register it. That is very pointed. If the traditional elements of authorship were produced by a machine, then the work lacks human authorship and the office will not register it. For example, when an AI technology receives solely a prompt from a human and produces complex written, visual, or musical works in response, the traditional elements of authorship are determined and executed by the technology, not the human user. This seems pretty unequivocal, and uh, I have not seen the Copyright Office back off of this. Clearly what this is saying, and they use it in the example, is if you are using, for example, a, a generative AI platform where you type in a prompt and it outputs some creative work like a photograph, that in and of itself, if all you have done is write that prompt, is not, does not constitute a copyrightable work. They are unequivocal about that. But um, uh, they go on and, and talk about a few other things here that I want to get into. When an AI tech technology determines the expressive elements of its output, the generated material is not the product of human authorship. As a result, that material is not protected by copyright and must be disclaimed in a registration application. However, there are situations that are not quite so clear. So the Copyright Office adds some additional guidance. They say, uh, for example, a human may select or arrange AI-generated material in a sufficiently creative way that the resulting work as a whole constitutes an original work of authorship. And so what, what they're saying is you can have human creativity, you can have substantial human involvement in the creation of a work okay. if that work is a selection and arrangement of AI created elements, the resulting work could constitute original work of authorship. But, and you have to disclaim the AI related materials. Um, before we get into the guidance, I'll leave this one last example. They say, for example, a visual artist who uses Adobe Photoshop to edit an image remains the author of the modified image and a musical artist may use effects such as guitar pedals when creating a sound recording. In each case, what matters is the extent to which the human had creative control over the work's expression and, quote, actually formed the traditional elements of authorship. Okay, so, so far, reading the guidance, I feel like we might not know exactly what constitutes enough human authorship, but we understand the other side. If there's no human input other than writing a prompt, it's not going to be uh, a work that's eligible for copyright protection. So then the office goes on and gives some guidance. And here's where we got some problems, in my view, in my view. So under the section guidance for copyright applicants, they say that 
applicants have a duty to disclose the inclusion of AI generated content in a work submitted for registration and to provide a brief explanation of the human author's contributions to the work. I want to stop for a second. Um, uh, and, and talk about this a little bit, a little bit more in detail because this came out in March and I think it was either the very end of May or the beginning of June when uh, Adobe, I guess it was in May, when Adobe uh, came out with the Photoshop beta that had generative fill as a tool inside of, of Photoshop. And you'll remember just a minute ago in the guidance, the, the copyright office refers to Adobe Photoshop. They say, a visual artist who uses Adobe Photoshop to edit an image remains the author of the modified image. Well, I'm not sure that that's still accurate based on uh, the inclusion of Firefly and, and uh, generative AI technologies into the Adobe Photoshop platform. And so this is one of the things I'll be interested to hear about today. But more importantly, I want you all to, to think about what the Copyright Office is saying. What they're saying is that if you have, if you have a work that you are submitting for registration that has AI generated content, you have a duty to disclose that content um, and to provide a brief explanation of the human author's contributions to the work. The lines are already blurred. Many of the Adobe tools that already existed uh, have as their underpinnings, AI related and machine learning related uh, techniques that have been around for years, right? And so one thing I'm very interested to hear is if the Copyright Office is going to elaborate on this. Is it simply generative AI tools? Is it, how are they going to make the distinction between, you know, um, a brush in Photoshop that might add in some pixels that were created from a generative AI uh, platform versus a healing brush, right? Which we've used, which which pull pixels from other places. Those pixels may not have necessarily ever existed in in real life. What what makes one human authorship and and another not human authorship? Yeah. It's going to be a tricky question. Yeah, because before generative fill tool came along, they had content aware fill, and that was such an easy way to just add some extra pixels if you wanted to fit it into the correct ratio. Um, I mean. It's, it's very complicated. When you read that guidance that you've just read out there, Thomas, the, the, it very much sounds like they are against uh, AI image programs like, like Midjourney. And so it's going to be very interesting today to see if they stick to that attitude. Um, because you, there, are, there are AI image enthusiasts out there who would make the argument that it is an art form. And actually, if anyone has used Midjourney or Dali, they will know that it, it's not straightforward just to get a spectacular image out of it. When they say a single text prompt, actually the reality is these people are trying hundreds of text prompts, tweaking it, you know, changing the weight of the prompts. Yeah, absolutely. Argument that it isn't it is it, it, it is its own craft. How do you and, tackle that? Yeah, you know, and and I think that's a really good point because one of the very first things that I started thinking about when I started talking to artists who who are AI artists is seeing how complex and how much time they take to craft those prompts to to create the works that they want to that they envision. That is. A, a, a creative art in and of itself. And so does copyright offer anything for them? Well, here's what I might consider the single biggest issue with the Copyright Office's guidance uh, so far on AI. And it's one that comes down to simply economics. Because what the Copyright Office says is Individuals who use AI technology in creating a work may claim copyright protection for their own contributions to that work. And now in red, they must use the standard application 
and in it identify the authors and provide a brief statement in the author created field that describes the authorship that was contributed by human. They must use the standard application. You know, that's only six words, but photographers are currently able to use the group registration for unpublished works or group registration for published works, which allow you for $65 to register up to 750 images at a time. And it is the one of the most important things that has come along um, in order to help photographers who create a vast number of works in a, in a shoot, in a weekend, um, to register their works and avail themselves of their protections under copyright law. But what this says is that if your work has any AI technology in its creation, you must use the standard application, which is not the group application, which allows you to register one image at a time for $55 or $65. And so what we're what the Copyright Office is doing here is 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 if this were to be the case, if this were to be the final rule on these things, um, many photographers who utilize Photoshop, who utilize the AI tools that are, are now coming out could not use the various group applications and would have to use the standard application. And that could be ruinous financially for almost every photographer. Um, and it is maybe the single biggest thing that I am interested to see if the Copyright Office is going to talk about today. And if they don't, it's something that um, when uh, when we're in uh, D.C. next month uh, uh, to talk with the Copyright Office, we're going to be bringing up because this is a major issue for um, for uh, copyright protection of A.I. works. Um, this is continues. They continue to talk about guidance for registrants. Um, AI generated content that is more than de minimis should be explicitly excluded from the application. So the Copyright Office is asking you to determine what pieces of the work are AI generated and more than a minimal amount. De minimis is a legal term that just means a little bit, right? There's some more formal definitions than that, but let's just think of it as a little bit. And this is putting more and more responsibility and more hurdles in front of the photographer who just wants to register their work with the Copyright Office. What now the Copyright Office is saying is you have to use this application and you have to write a narrative about any AI generated parts of the image that are more than de minimis and that has to be explicitly excluded and you have to tell them what the human part is. This is going in the wrong direction, in my view, and I'm speaking now on behalf of ASMP. This is going in the wrong direction because we have been fighting for more than 75 years to get copyright, um, the Copyright Office to make it easier for creators to protect their works, not harder, right? Um, I We're going to wrap this up here shortly. I, I wanted to just add... Uh, one more thing, you know, the Copyright Office says applicants who have already submitted applications for works containing AI generated material should check that the information provided to the office adequately disclose that material. Well, I will tell you this. If if a, if a photographer out there before this guidance came out adequately disclosed the AI generated material, I would be shocked. I haven't met anyone who has or would or would have even known to do that. And so now in this one paragraph, the Copyright Office is saying, hey, you have to go and, and if you already submitted it, then you should, quote, take steps to correct their information so the registration remains effective. Again, hurdles. Hurdles in the way of what is a, a constitutional right, something that under the, the Berne Treaty should not have these type of, uh, of, of, of hurdles placed in front of them. Um, they talk about how you should submit a supplementary registration. Well, guess what? Those are not free, right? You don't get to, to do these things. And, and the Copyright Office is, is charging money to, to, uh, uh, to correct works. 
um, these are issues. These are unresolved issues that we have um, that we have a problem with. So these are some of the things that I'm going to be looking for today uh, during the Copyright Office webinar. And I think that um, uh, again, I'll put that PDF uh, PDF up in the uh, ASP Academy uh, document library, so y'all can refer to it. Um, uh, I think that uh, I'm interested to see if what the Copyright Office does today. It may be all they do is exactly what I did, which is read from the guidance they've already created. But I'm hoping for more because that guidance came out in March, uh, March 16th of this year. And we are now months later. And the, the landscape has already changed significantly since March. And um, uh, creators of every type, not just photographers, but the authors and the musicians and the graphic artists and the fine artists need help with this. And the guidance that's been uh, submitted is not entirely helpful. And, uh, and there are some things that need to be fixed. Matt, before we, before we wrap up and, um, and let everyone get over to the Copyright Office webinar uh, uh, and we go on a little break here, any thoughts, anything you want to you want to uh, talk about before we head out? Well, I think we know for absolutely certain that they are not going to suddenly turn around and say that AI or a machine can hold copyright, which is something that there are people pushing for, which, which is kind of crazy. Um, I. I'm just so curious to see what they're going to say, because as you rightly said, a lot has changed since March. And it is so interesting that they're, they're, they're talking about Photoshop, because Photoshop is now suddenly almost at the right at the front of this queue of, of, of generative AI. Um, and they're in, they, you know, they've incorporated it in, into Photoshop. So I, I, I don't know. I, I I, I, say, I say one thing, I do not envy them because it is a very difficult thing to try and issue guidance for and to try and understand which is the right thing to do um, because it's, it's a very difficult and it's a complex landscape. I am I'm on tenterhooks uh, <laughs> awaiting what they are going to say in just under 10 minutes time. Absolutely. Well, Matt, uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for, for joining us and for providing your insight. If you have not uh, had a chance to read many of Matt's articles over at Petapixel, please go over and, and check them out. It's one of the first places I go uh, when I'm interested in learning what is new in the AI world and photography. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm excited as well uh, for this Copyright Office webinar. Um, at, at the bottom of the screen, a scrolling text tells you how you can go register. Um, I made a quick bit.ly link. It's just over at the copyright uh, office site, which is copyright.gov. Uh, type in events into the, um, into the search box and you'll be able to see a Zoom registration. Um, we are going to uh, go ahead and, and sign off for the moment. This live stream will remain live. Uh, we'll have a graphic up that says we'll be back after the Copyright Office webinar is over. Uh, and so definitely encourage you to go um, and, uh, and register and watch totally free. And let's see if we get some of these questions answered. Um, I uh, am not necessarily holding my breath, but uh, even if we can get a little bit more information, I think, uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll consider that some level of victory although there's some major concerning things, as we pointed out, that we need to be aware of. I want to I wanna thank you. Uh, if, uh, if you don't happen to come back and watch the end of this live stream, you will be able to watch it um, as a recording on our YouTube channel uh, and over at ASMP.org. Uh, but I want to thank you for, for joining us today, and, and thank you, Matt. We're going to uh, go offline now, uh, leave the live stream open and the graphic up, and I will be back to join you. Um, here after the Copyright Office webinar. So thank you so much. Thank you.
Nevertheless, Matt, nevertheless, I, uh, I'll, I'll jump in and uh, maybe um, why don't you try to log on again uh, if you could. I, I will remove you. Just click on that same link and we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's see. I, um, I made a few notes here and, uh, and, and a few things that I thought were of interest. And we're going to parse through some of this um, uh, in the coming days and weeks. Um, you may have seen uh, uh, that they said in the webinar that their recording would be uh, posted uh, within the next three weeks. That's quite a while. Uh, as soon as it is, we will definitely have a link to that um, on on our side. A few things that I thought might be worth uh, might be worth discussing. All right. Hello. Hey. All right, Matt, there we are. I can hear you now. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. All the better for sitting through that webinar. How are you, Tom? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I, I just wanted to hit a, a few a few things that I made notes on, and then uh, I'll get your thoughts, Matt, and then we'll wrap up with maybe a few questions left unanswered. Um, you know, the first thing I wrote down is is when they said that there have been fewer than 100 claims so far of generative AI work which seems incredible. Um, and that, that tells me one of two things. One, no one knows what they're supposed to be doing when it comes to registering generative AI works because there's zero chance that the registrations that have come in have not included those works in the last six months. And two, that I hope that because of those numbers, the Copyright Office isn't basing their procedure on this idea that this is not an important area to um, uh, to refine, you know, they may say, "Well, we only had a hundred of this type, so we're not we're going to focus our attention elsewhere." Because I think this is the type of thing that that can quickly become an avalanche. There was one significant shift that I wanted to note here at the top, and and it has to do with a subtle word choice. Previously, and by previously, I mean in the last number of years, um, when we talked about human authorship, the Copyright Office used the word substantial human authorship. And substantial has a, a, a meaning to it. Today, the only phrase you really heard was appreciable, appreciable use of, of uh, AI or appreciable you know, human authorship, those types of words, which is a different level of um of requirement now at the very end there was a question that came from the audience they said they had 180 questions i think they answered like four so um uh, including a, a few that i i had put in that that didn't get answered but we're gonna do our best to get those answered um and the question was <laughs> i could feel the frustration in the questioner's uh, uh words when they said hey Everyone just needs to know what is the line. Where's the line where it's a, a uh, you know where it's appreciable um, human uh, involvement or appreciable AI where we have to disclaim it. And the answer, and you know, I, I don't think we could have expected anything different. But the answer was something to the to the extent of uh, that's a mixed question of law and fact, and then a bunch of lawyers talking about things, right? And, and there wasn't an answer. And that's because I don't think there is an answer, um, at least one not that the Copyright Office is able to give, um, is able to give right now. Um, one thing I noted as well is that I, on slide two or three, they listed AI-generated uh, content as one of the five categories of unclaimable material. That was not the case, you know, they didn't have that listed out last year, right? It was, um, this is now obviously a new category of unclaimable material that the Copyright Office has noted. Um, so I, I have a few more notes that I want to get to, Matt, but, but what were some of your overall impressions of this, uh, just, just listening as, as you've been following all these stories? Yeah, I, the unclaimable material line really struck me as well because they are ranking it alongside uh, public domain material or previously registered material or just other general copyrighted material and 
I mean, to me, AI generated works is kind of the odd one out on that list. Um, so I, 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 you know, obviously they're trying to put it into a, a category, but yeah, to me, that was, that was very interesting. And I, I know I don't know how many people were, were were following this closely, but I imagine that will that will come as a surprise um, to, to quite a quite a lot of people, quite a lot of people. But yeah, I mean, you know, they are they are unequivocal. Uh, you know, if 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 it's been generated by AI, it is not going to be registered, which means it it's not it's not anything anyone can use your. Work your work but it's not yeah. in their eyes it's not anyone's work because it was made by a computer lots of people would feel differently about that right right you know i think you you do have to look at the ai debate from both sides there are many uh, many of our members photographers who um who do not use ai and many who do in part of the their creation process and so the question then becomes if if you spend hours working uh, on uh, on final images that include AI generated things, what the copyright office is saying is that those parts that are AI generated are not subject to protection. Um, those can be taken and used in the same way that public domain uh, works can be taken and used, at least to the extent of those portions of the work. Um, yeah. You know, I. It, there's a question at the end, and it's a question that doesn't particularly pertain to the visual arts or photography, but uh, but has to do with, are the prompts themselves um, copyrightable? And, um, you know, the answer from the copyright office was, yes, they would be if they fulfill the other requirements, but note that it's not the prompt as a underlying thing that generates visual work that's that's copyrightable it's the prompt as a piece of text in the yeah. same way that a short story would be copyrightable uh a a prompt would be copyrightable um you know i i i just want to hit one or two other things here i would say the majority of this hour and 15 minute webinar was based on how to disclaim and disclose AI generated materials in your copyright application. And what I took away from this more than anything else is they are not going to change at least right now, the requirement to disclaim and disclose those AI generated materials. They are going to expect you, the applicant to figure out how to do that correctly and effectively. Um, you, you did hear one thing in there, and that was a very important court case um, that, was, uh, that was decided a few years back now, uh, the uh, Unicolors uh, versus H&M. And Unicolors versus H&M stands for the proposition that um, mistakes of law or mistakes of fact in copyright applications uh, can't be used to, um, to invalidate uh, the registration. Here's the problem we're facing because that's been a safe haven um, recently uh, when people make their very best efforts. Because of the way that the Copyright Office has, has laid out the requirements and the rules here, um, you would have to argue that, that you, you knew all the requirements and rules but still you know, chose, chose not to disclaim AI-related materials, again, that gets into a very fuzzy line that the copyright office is not willing to answer at the moment. And, and frankly, and I don't know that, that there is necessarily an answer on that. That's going to require a little more um, keeping an eye on people who are trying to use the, uh, the benefit of the Unicolor Supreme Court case um, if someone tries to invalidate their registration, if it's being invalidated on the grounds of AI. Um, inclusion, AI-generated inclusion. Um, I, I'll, I'll wrap with this uh, on, on my side, and then I'd love to get any, any final thoughts from you, Matt. But, you know, there are 1,500 people there today, they said, 180 questions that were answered. People are, are interested in understanding this. People want to register their works the right way. And, and uh, I hope the Copyright Office continues to make it easier for, for applicants to do just that, 
the copyright office uh, exists to help creators um, uh, protect their works and, and to fulfill the treaties the U.S. has entered into and to promote the useful arts and sciences, as it says in the Constitution. And, and uh, um, we had been in a period of, of maybe getting rid of some of the hurdles and, and now it feels with AI like we're adding some back. I, 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 hope, that, I hope that will change. Um, here in in the future, um, but uh, uh, Matt, um, before before we let you go uh, over over where you are and hopefully get some rest, uh, any any final thoughts on on what we heard today? Um, it's it's not the end. Um, there will be changes on this in the future. I think that the copyright office is probably trying to play it safe they certainly don't want to you know really disturb um the landscape at the moment um and maybe they're going to wait for someone else to do that maybe they're going to wait for the courts or just for the the private industry itself um but i mean as for photographers you know for those who don't use ai then I guess it's 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 all well and good, but for those that do and want to register it well, there's more obstacles uh, in their way. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, we are going to stay on top of of this. Obviously, you'll you'll be seeing a number more presentations and webinars. If you missed our town hall, um, you can find that on our YouTube channel and at the ASMP Academy, uh, where I went into a number of basic AI related things last week. Um, you know. What I would say is this, um, our goal uh, at ASMP is to help uh, visual creators protect their works, protect their livelihoods, um, and be able to uh, do what they do best, and that's, and that's create. Um, I think that this is an area that we have a long way to go with things changing uh, every, every month. I didn't get the sense that there was significantly more new information the Copyright Office had to give us today than they gave us in the March guidance. Um, and we're going to be looking for more guidance in the coming months um, to help refine some of these questions. I will end with one of those things I mentioned um, when we're looking at the PDF, and that is um, we have to figure out a way for photographers in particular and for anyone who uses a group application, of which there are a few different types, that group applications um, uh, can be used with being able to uh, disclaim and disclose AI-related materials instead of having to use the standard application one at a time. Um, that is a, a big deal and a big barrier to entry. And so we're going to keep on that as well as everything else. And Matt, uh, let me just uh, uh, say again how appreciative I am of, uh, of the work you do and the work Petapixel does for uh, keeping the community informed. And uh, uh, I've enjoyed having you here today, and I hope you come back soon. We'll do another program together, okay? I hope so. Thank you so much for having me on, Tom. Great. Everyone, have a great evening, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye now. See you.